Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Ant-Man brought a bit of grounded humor back to the MCU, and also an alternate dimension that the Avengers hijacked for time travel! The film's experimentation made it one of the most important to our Infinity Saga rewatch for the future of the MCU. Let's break down all the tiny details you overlooked in Ant-Man to see how this movie set up Endgame and beyond. The opening scene's a flashback to 1989, showing the early construction for S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Triskelion, later shown completed in Winter Soldier. The de-aged Hank Pym meets with an aged up Peggy Carter, Howard Stark, and Mitchell Carson. In the comics, Mitch Carson was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who was supposed to take on the Ant-Man suit, but he ended up turning dark. He got a nasty facial scar, which Hank might also allude to by calling back the face slam later. How's your face? Here, Carson is secretly a Hydra agent, which might be a nod to the third Ant-Man in the comics, Eric O'Grady, who works for Hydra. Hank is pissed that S.H.I.E.L.D. is trying to replicate his Pym tech. Some believe that Hank's distrust of Howard could have been caused by Cap stealing Pym particles when Hank and Howard were both at Camp Lehigh in 1970. Maybe Hank might have blamed Howard for that, but that would all depend on how you interpret Endgame's time travel logic, something that that movie's writers and directors disagree on. So how are we supposed to know? Here, Howard says, don't let your past determine the future. An interesting quote reflecting Howard's attitude toward Tony explored back in Iron Man 2. I'm limited by the technology of my time. And it ends up coming full circle when they meddle with Howard and Hank in Endgame. No amount of money ever bought a second of time. Smart guy. On many levels, this Ant-Man film is all about passing the torch. Ant-Man is the first real multi-generational legacy hero explored in the MCU, and it gives this cinematic universe a roadmap for how to pass power from one generation to the next, and how that can be a good thing. We meet Scott Lang on his way out of San Quentin prison, the same Bay Area prison Frank Castle did some time in, and in the Sony Marvel universe that's like weirdly connected to the MCU apparently, the prison Cletus Cassidy Carnage is hanging out in. Scott Lang was introduced to the MCU in promos, with WHIH reporter Christine Everhart from the early Iron Man movies. I reported on Tony Stark in Galmera, and believe me, you're no Tony Stark. Thank God. Picking him up in the now legendary X-Con van is one of the best MCU contributions, Luis. Oh yeah, I still got my scar from a year ago. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm still the only one to knock him out. Luis's boxing skills actually aren't just throwaway. We do see him knock out a guard later. Scott gets a job at Baskin Robbins. Darby, could you just... Uh... Take care of this idiot, thanks. Scott's fake name, Jack, and his coworker, Darby, are nods to Rudd's children, Jack and Darby. Sadly, Baskin Robbins always finds out. And Scott heads home, he passes a sign for Pingo Doce, the beverage that Bruce Banner worked at a bottling plant for in Brazil in The Incredible Hulk. And the Milgram Hotel is a nod to Al Milgram, a writer and artist for Marvel Comics. Hank returns to his old Pimtech lab. His security check-in gives us a close-up of his keys with this Russian tank on the keychain. It's marked 153, and it shows up moments later in the S.H.I.E.L.D. footage of Pim Ant-Man in action. Hank shrunk down this real tank from his Cold War missions. It shows up a few more times throughout the movie before it blows back up Chekhov's tank. Darren Cross greets him, and notice the guy on the tour, later suggested by Carson to be a Hydra affiliate, but he's got this barely visible neck tattoo, establishing him as a member of the Ten Rings Network. A deleted shot from the sequence would have given us a clearer look at it, but you can see it again later when he gets knocked out. That's a scary, scary glare of a Mandarin loyalist. So, the same network who first kidnapped Tony Stark, who broke the fake Mandarin out of Seagate prison, and is behind the real Mandarin in the upcoming Shang-Chi, was here in this movie trying to get Hank Pym's resizing tech. Darren shows shield footage of Hank as Ant-Man during the Cold War. An Ant-Man. <laughs> That's what they called you. Right, Hank? Silly, I know. Propaganda. Tales to Astonish. Tales to Astonish was the Marvel title Ant-Man first debuted under in 1962. This archive footage is this movie's way of acknowledging Ant-Man's history as a legacy older era superhero who passes the torch onto a new generation. Scott Lang takes the torch in this movie, but in this moment, Hope Van Dyne forces this smile at this history because she knows she's more worthy of that torch, though later, the wrong choice Pym's successor foreshadows Hope's ascendancy as the Wasp. Because his failures as a mentor as a father, forced us to spread our wings. And on a meta level, this whole movie is a torch passed on. Pym's flashback mission here was from the film's original prologue that would have showed Hank in Panama in the 60s, one of the many sequences from the movie's original writer-director, Edgar Wright, director of the Cornetto trilogy, Scott Pilgrim, who developed his version of Ant-Man over a decade. But disputes over this movie's connectivity to the MCU led to Wright and his partner, Joe Cornish, leaving and being replaced by director Peyton Reed and Adam McKay, who rewrote the script with Paul Rudd. Thus, the 
complicated writing credits on this movie, Darren unveils the yellow jacket suit, which was originally an alternate suit worn by Ant-Man in the comics. The texture of the suit and the vault windows take a hexagonal honeycomb pattern. Yellow jackets are often confused with bees, but they don't make honey, maybe reflecting Darren's failure to appreciate his own tech. In the promo video, the yellow jacket assassinates targets and notice this blaster sound effect. To carry out protective. The sound designers use the sound effect of the AT-80 uh -uh, blasters from the Empire Strikes Back. And you can hear the sound again in the final fight. Poor Frank is our Admiral Mahdi in this scenario, with Darren putting the sand on his shoulder to signal his horrific murder! The most haunting and disgusting death of the MCU to date! Which, yeah, really triggered me when he pats Hank the same way later. Scott crashes the birthday party of his daughter, Cassie Lang, an older version recently played by Emma Furman in Avengers Endgame, perhaps the future young Avenger stature. Scott gives her a terrifying rabbit. <laughs> you are my bestest friend! He's so ugly! The voice of this rabbit is actually a cameo by Spongebob voice actor Tom Kenny. Louis tells Scott about the job using his hilarious telephone bit. He tells me that she's working as a housekeeper now, right? And she's dating this dude Carlos who's a shot caller from across the bay. And she tells him about the dude that she's cleaning for, right? That he's like this big shot CEO that is all retired now, but is loaded. And I will repeat my call for every MCU film to precede with an opening short, Luis recapping the previous events. And the jazzy 7-4 time signature heist music that plays here later inspired the similar jazzy heist theme that plays during the endgame time heist planning sequence. How works. Now we gotta figure out the when and the where. When Kurt picks up the cleaning crew uniform, the company is Berg Uniform and Linen, a nod to the movie's art department head, Susan Berg. Tom breaks into Hank's house and finds the Ant-Man suit. The helmet design actually resembles Ultron's head because the designers based it on the fact that in the comics, Ultron was created by Hank Pym, but not in the cinematic universe. Scott puts on the suit, triggers the Pym particles, and shrinks. The designers of this movie display the resizing with these ripple lines, inspired by Ant-Man's resizing in the comics, which was based on stop-motion photography and multiple exposure shots. When shrunken, they fill the surroundings with dust mites, floating particles, as the world would look from a smaller vantage point, based on macro photography. And and when he lands outside the tub, he cracks the floor tile because this movie establishes the bonkers physics of shrinking an object by reducing the distance between atoms while maintaining its weight and density. Yet yeah, somehow Hank can carry the weight of a tank on his keys. Yeah, there's a reason Ant-Man logic is the most frequently requested topic for big questions. Scott tumbles through his downstairs neighbor's rave in a vacuum and a mouse! All this scrambling through a shower and running into a mouse were inspired by Ant-Man's first adventure in 1962. And some have wondered if this mouse is the same rodent in Endgame that scurried over the van controls to release Scott from the quantum realm and save the universe. I love the idea, but it's unlikely they have a lifespan of two to three years, and Scott's return in Endgame was eight years after this. There's a cameo by Garrett Morris, who was technically the first actor to play Ant-Man on screen in a 1979 SNL sketch. Hank helps Scott escape from jail, and he runs across a newspaper with this headline, Who's to blame for Sokovia? Senate Oversight Committee demands independent investigation, tying together the aftermath from Age of Ultron with the Sokovia Accords introduced in Civil War. They also bring up these events later. I think our first move should be calling the Avengers. Besides, they're probably too busy dropping cities out of the sky. Yeah, you know, some of these details are tough to spot, blend in seamlessly with the background, kind of like a, what the heck is this? A sleek front pocket wallet like the Ridge. Thanks to the Ridge for sponsoring this video. The Ridge wallet is light and sleek and industrial. It's designed to fit in your front pocket, unlike those bulky 90s style back pocket wallets that give you a big ass. This one is their titanium black design. It's smooth, it's minimalist, blends in seamlessly, and uh, that titanium? Try shrinking through those atoms, Ant-Man. And hey, folks, when you go out for essentials these days, just take the minimal essentials with you to make for quick, hassle-free transactions, right? The Ridge Wallet comes in over 30 styles and colors, including carbon fiber and burnt to titanium. It holds up to 12 cards and still has room for cash, assuming you still use those dusty old greenbacks. Every Ridge Wallet comes with a lifetime guarantee, and they'll let you test drive it for 45 days and send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. It's got 30,000 five-star reviews, so they're doing something right. They also have great backpacks and travel bags with RFID blocking pockets and optional device charging batteries. Father's Day is coming up in June, and the Ridge Wallet would make a great gift for Pops. Ridge Wallets are chainsaw proof, so when Dad trips in the garage, he doesn't have to worry about a touch-up on that vasectomy. Oh boy! Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash newrockstars. That's ridge.com slash newrockstars, and use the code newrockstars. Find the link in the video's description. Hank explains to Scott his retirement. Why don't you wear the suit? You think I don't want to? I can't. 
spend years wearing it. It took a toll on me. This toll is the suit's effect on the brain, mentioned moments earlier. It can affect the brain's chemistry. I don't think Darren realizes this, and you know, he's not the most stable guy to begin with. Later on in the movie, Hope brings this up again with Darren. This is not who you are. It's the particles altering your brain chemistry. Though notice that brain chemistry line was said off screen. I'm guessing it was dubbed in later to make this all clearer. Why is this important? Well, part of Hank Pym's legacy from the comics is a very controversial 1981 issue where he assaults Janet Van Dyne. It was reportedly a miscommunication between the comic writer and the artist. Whatever happened, fans turned against the character. Marvel ended up explaining Hank was having a mental breakdown and they expelled him from the Avengers. But this is part of the reason why it's healthy to pass the torch. The longer someone's in the spotlight, the more likely they'll do something that'll piss everyone off. MCU Hank, of course, never abused Janet, but Darren exemplifies the cautionary tale of how this tech takes a physical toll on one's body. And both Hank Pym's tech and the Stark family tech he despises carry expiration dates that require these heroes to pass down the power onto a new generation. And that includes probably Cassie Lang's stature one day. I mean, Scott's already starting to lose it. <gasps> oh, you okay? Did I hurt you? It's out of context, but I had to do it, I'm sorry. Hank advises Scott. The suit has power. The man harnesses that power. Another example of how Ant-Man and the Starks are more alike than different. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it, okay? Gotta sound like my dad. Hank broadens the MCU for us. It means that you would enter a quantum realm. What does that mean? It means that you would enter a reality where all concepts of time and space become irrelevant. The Quantum Realm was the MCU's name for the Microverse, or Microworld, Subatomica, it's going by a bunch of different names, but Marvel couldn't use them at the time because all this was in a way associated with the Fantastic Four, which was then a Fox property. Hank reveals Janet's disappearance into the Quantum Realm, shrinking between atoms to stop an ICBM. Later, when Scott goes subatomic, a shadow of the Wasp appears on screen and reflecting from his helmet, setting up Janet's return in Ant-Man and the Wasp. They infiltrate what Hank thinks is an old Stark warehouse without knowing that the Avengers really located there at the end of Age of Ultron. If you look closely at the lawn, you can see the burn mark that Thor's Bifrost left there. That man has no regard for lawn maintenance. If you think about it, neither does Scott. <laughs> Falcon Sam Wilson appears and Scott takes him down using the same move Hope used on Scott earlier, which is why she reacts so impressed here. And in case you're wondering, director Peyton Reed just revealed that the person Sam is radioing to is Natasha Black Widow. Luis, Kurt, and Dave help them break back into the lab. Yeah, Luis whistling, it's a small world after all. So it in there. Makes the second Marvel movie in a row to sample the songbook of their new corporate overlords. There are no strings on me. Darren traps Scott, but Scott escapes, and Carson also manages to slip away with Cross's yellow shrinking vial, deliberately left open for the MCU to return to later. Add that to the list of the leader and Abomination and a bunch of these guys. Scott uses the guards' attacks against them, leaping through the bullet hole that they just shot, using their gun barrel as a running start before using the other guy's tie to flip him through the glass. Some of this choreography was taken directly from Edgar Wright's test footage shown in Comic-Con in 2012. Scott confronts Darren in the helicopter. Did you think you could stop the future? With a heist? Uh, Darren, a heist is exactly how Scott helps the Avengers stop the future in Endgame a move on. They fight inside the suitcase. They accidentally play the Cure's disintegration on the phone. Notice how all of the tactical uses of the shrinking suit that Darren promised back in his promo video earlier get shown throughout this movie in the plan to bring Darren down. Shrinking through a keyhole, going into a briefcase, disabling a lab, crashing a helicopter, and lasering through people's heads. Thought he was selling some weapons really foreshadowing his own death. Darren targets Cassie and the final fight takes place on her Thomas a Tank Engine set, which the rights holders to Thomas only allowed under the condition that no character can be tied to the train track and Thomas isn't depicted doing anything evil. I guess crushing a cop car ain't evil. The bull, please. Scott shrinks between the titanium atoms of Darren's suit, breaking its regulator and causing his arm to horrifically shrink off his body. <laughs> Ugh. Thankfully, this brings an end to Feige's phase two amputation frenzy, and we'll shrink it down for you this time. 
as Scott Ghost Subatomic. In addition to the Wasp Shadow I talked about earlier, he passes a Tardigrade, the microorganism that shows up again in Ant-Man and the Wasp. Scott makes it back out, blowing Hank's mind. Are you went in. He got out. It's amazing. His photo of Janet, you know, the one that doesn't show her face, but he framed it, foretells a return in the next film and foretells Scott's future return after the five-year gap in Endgame. The film closes with another recap montage from Luis with Stan Lee's cameo and another possible nod in here. I'm looking for this dude who's new on scene, who's like flashing this fresh tack, who's got like bomb moves, right? Who you got? She's like, well, we got everything nowadays. We got a guy who jumps, we got a guy who swings, we got a guy who crawls up the walls. You gotta be more specific. Mm, that sounds a bit like Spider-Man to me. Though the this movie was written before that deal was signed, so who knows. But Spider-Man, like Ant-Man, gets his own tonally different MCU introduction very soon. The second post credit scene shows how this will all tie into the next film, Captain America Civil War, with this clip directed by the Russo brothers. We're on our own. Maybe not. I know a guy. I love how they included the Bucky scream sound effect in there. Watch our breakdown of Winter Soldier for more details on that. But the first post credit scene is the film's true legacy. You can't destroy power. All you can do is make sure that it's in the right hands. It's about damn time. Hope's line reflects the fact that Wasp is finally getting her on-screen due despite being part of the original Avengers lineup in the 60s. It's interesting how this film includes subtle setups for Spider-Man and Stature in the Young Avengers and Shang-Chi in the Ten Rings, all titles that appear to be leading Marvel's Phase 4 future. Ant-Man didn't just set up the Wasp and the mechanics for time travel in Endgame, it shows the MCU how sunsetting the old guard can pave the way for new heroes in a very entrenched cinematic universe, a trick that they will use again to pass the torch to Black Panther to Captain Marvel. And if you think about it with Peter Parker as Tony Stark's legacy, Spider-Man. None of that would have been quite as good if the MCU didn't have this little guy to flick. New Rockstar's Infinity Saga rewatch is charging forward into the big launch of Marvel Phase 3, Captain America Civil War. And you can join our watch along on Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash new rockstars. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter, follow new rockstars, and subscribe to see us break down the movie that made us all covered in more sticky goo than Falcon and Bucky. Oh, gross.